It's a pleasure to have uh, Alex Cook from the Socio School of Public Health with me today. And we're going to talk a little bit about the COVID-19 epidemic. And um, so I thought I would start with looking at the total cases. Uh, these are the sort of uh, plots you can see uh, online nowadays. And I want to talk a little bit about how we can mathematically model this sort of curve. And um, Alex, any, any specific features that you can explain to us in this picture? Yeah. yeah, so if you take a look at the early period of the outbreak, that's from the Wuhan and Hubei outbreaks. Um, and there you can see it's kind of an exponential growth, a common pattern that we see in a lot of epidemics. After some time, um, there's a, a change, a kind of a kink in the curve, and that's due to, we think, changes in the testing. Um, and then at the later point of that, you're starting to get a lot of overseas spread, mm. and you start to see a new exponential growth in other countries outside China. Right, so I think we're, you're talking about these, these, uh, this accelerated curve here as well as over yeah. here, right? So that's sort of the, the global epidemic and that's sort of the Wuhan epidemic happening. Correct, yes. There. So what sort of um, mathematical models do you use to sort of describe this curve mathematically yeah. that you can later on use for statistical modeling as well? Yeah. So we usually build compartmental models. So mm -hmm. the idea of a compartmental model is that everyone in the population belongs to one of several compartments corresponding to their disease status. So we often build something called an SIR model. Um, people start off susceptible, they become infectious, and then they become removed from the outbreak. And of course, they're flowing from the left to the right. So just to clarify, I mean, epidemic models, they, they make a distinction between infectious and infected. So infected doesn't mean that you can transmit the, uh, the infection, mm, right? So that's infectious true. here, we mean that you are able to, uh, to transmit the infection by that, sneezing and so on. That's so true, forth. yes. yes. Um, and so we'll represent the flows of people between these different states mathematically by introducing parameters which govern how rapidly people move from one mm. state to the next. So this parameter beta corresponds to a combination of how much people come into contact with each other mm -hmm. as well as the risk of transmission when you come into contact. Mm -hmm. um, the parameter gamma represents how quickly you recover from a disease. So for COVID, what is that? What's your estimate for gamma? Ah, people probably infectious for about a week or so. Mm -hmm. So maybe something like 0 0.2, 0 0.15 or so. So that's something. sort of the daily rate of recovery, yes, maybe right. 0.2. That's like on average will take five days to yes. recover. Okay. So what is the sort of? There are two parameters here, but what sort of? Are there any any sort of parameter that we can extract from this that that determines the overall shape of what's going on? Well, and we can relate that to the uh, to the curve that we see. Yeah. Both their parameters are, are actually quite important, um, but we often will combine them into one parameter called the reproduction number. So that represents how infectious, how many infections a person creates over their infectious lifespan. Um, and there's a nice relationship between the parameters, um, beta and gamma, which tells us what the reproduction number R0 is. This serves as an important threshold parameter, because if R0 is equal to one, then that means that each person who is infected can only infect one other person on average. Mm. Therefore, the epidemic is not going to grow. Whereas if R0 is more than one, then the epidemic will grow because each person maybe infects two people and then those two people infect four people and so on. Mm. So, so what's, what's I mean, our note for, for the COVID-19? What's so, your estimate? Uh, so there's a, a different estimates out there. Um, kind of a consensus is probably around about two, meaning that each person infects around about two people on average. Mm. Um, is that high or is that low? I, I mean, what are the diseases, what sort of uh, uh, numbers do they have? Yeah, so I would say two is actually quite high and I'll, I'll say why. So there's a relationship between the reproduction number mm -hmm. and the number of people who will finally be attacked mm. by the virus. It's um, given by this formula here. So mm -hmm. F is the final attack rate. Um, and this is quite a simple relationship with R0. If R0 is 2, then that suggests that 80% of the population will get infected if the virus cannot be checked through other means like vaccination okay. or something. Yeah, so many of the measures that we see are probably not meant to uh, completely stop the epidemic, but just to bring R0 uh, below 1 so that, the, so, that, that, so that eventually dies out and doesn't cause right, an, uh, yeah. a major outbreak. Yeah. Um, so are there any other estimates? I mean, how we, can we compare now the curves that we get from this model with the, with the ones from... Uh, Oh. The actual data, is there anything we can use to compare that? I mean, yeah. this is the actual data, can you compare? Okay, so um, what, we, what emerges from this model in the early period is something that looks like an exponential growth. Mm. And that's what we see in the actual case data. 
Um, however, it, as time goes on, you get something that's more like a logistic growth. Mm -hmm. And you can start to see that, um, perhaps not in this aggregate data, but we can see that from the case data that's emerging from Wuhan just now, um, where there's a tapering off in the number of new infections every day. All right, so that, I mean, that's... A little bit like that. Sort of, we can see that a little yeah. bit here, right? That it starts to flatten off. That's also what we see over here. How do you, in practice, actually estimate this, this number? Uh, so there's a few methods. One is because we have an exponential growth in the early period of the outbreak, mm. we can use some statistical methods which take number of cases and the transformation of that, and that will tell us something about the reproduction number. Mm. Well, uh, uh, you can also probably use contact tracing, right? So you see how many how many people um, a specific case has infected, and you can uh, go from there as well. Yeah, that's true. So at present, um, from the contact tracing MOH is doing in Singapore, it looks like our lot is less than one. But that is probably because of the stringent isolation and quarantine mm. policies. And when the epidemic gets bigger because of importations from other countries, it may not be possible to keep it that low. Mm. I mean, I mean, we have to be aware that if our node is about two and 80% of the population is being infected, I mean, uh, maybe COVID with a mortality rate of about 1%, that, that translates into a lot of deaths, actually. Yeah, right? tens of So 80%, yeah. that's about 4 million people in Singapore, and 1% of that is about 40,000 deaths if we leave it unchecked. So that's, uh, so that's a sort of, so, so I guess that's why the reason why you want to know our nodes right from the start as early as possible so that you can sort of estimate um, how much how many effort we've got to do to exactly. try to stop it. I mean, also, I want to show maybe this curve here that uh, here our note, our note is, in this case, I put our note to about two. And I mean, one of the important features is the, the things you want to understand is at the peak, how many infected people you have so that you can start planning um, how many hospital beds yeah. and you need and how many ICU uh, beds you actually need so that you can plan ahead of that. And I think you have been involved with that as well. And yep. to help the uh, Ministry of Health to um, sort of get some uh, ideas for that. Yep, that's okay. what we're doing at present. All right. All right, it was a pleasure. Great, thank you very much. To you. Thank you very much for coming.